Welcome to Contingency Planning, geared toward the exotic animal industry. This series of modules has been developed to assist exotic animal industry owners and operators with development of contingency plans that would be used in the event of an incident, emergency, or disaster that could impact your facility or operations. The subject matter experts who assisted with development of these modules represent a broad base of animal and emergency management expertise. If you have yet to start on developing your own plans, it is hoped that this training will introduce you to some of the important concepts in contingency planning to start off on the right foot. If you already have plans in place, we hope that you will learn something new that will improve the next versions of your plans. So here is the fine print. We really do want you to read through this, but in the interest of time, essentially we want to remind you that emergency and disaster response involving wildlife is potentially dangerous. Don't mistake having a good plan with having the right training to execute your plan. We will talk more about training in Module 6. As authors of this training material, we cannot be held responsible for your individual plans, and any examples we use in this training are just for illustrative purposes only. This presentation is brought to you by the ZAP Fusion Center. ZAP stands for Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Preparedness, Response, and Recovery Fusion Center. Hence the need for a catchy acronym. The Fusion Center is hosted by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums with generous support from the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA. Please note that the center serves all licensed exhibitors and exotic animal owners. I am Dr. Yvonne Nadler, and I am the program manager for the ZAP Fusion Center. I have worked extensively with the zoological community on contingency planning and foreign animal disease preparedness. I am privileged to work with a number of stakeholder groups to integrate our industry with companion and agricultural animal emergency management. Your trainer for this presentation is Dr. Mark Lloyd. Dr. Lloyd has decades of experience as a zoological and wildlife veterinarian. He possesses extensive knowledge and experience in risk assessment and disaster preparedness and response in this exotic animal community. So take it away, Dr. Lloyd. Why is this training so important? Well, many lessons were learned about the management of animals and disasters in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. When the USDA did a retrospective analysis of how exhibitor community fared, they recognized that the licensed exhibitors who had plans in place prior to the hurricane were better prepared to respond to the hazard and were quicker to recover from the effects of the hurricane. In short, they were able to get back to business quicker. In 2008, USDA proposed a rule change to the Animal Welfare Act, or AWA, which defines the regulatory requirements for exhibitors to maintain their licenses. USDA desired to add a rule change to the act that would require exhibitors to have written contingency plans in place. While that proposed rule is currently in stay or on hold for right now, it is anticipated that this proposed change will soon become part of the Animal Welfare Act. Some licensed exhibitors may be exempt from this proposed change, but whether or not you're required to have a plan, you should have a plan for the safety of your staff, your animals, and yourself. This is a great quote. It's attributed to Mr. Terry Lincoln of the Dakota Zoo. It sums up the vulnerability that you have as owners and operators of exotic animal industry facilities. While there are great just-in-time training programs for the management of dogs and cats and other domestic animals during disasters, there are no just-in-time training for managing lions. You are a vulnerable community because your expertise is so specialized. Mr. Lincoln said these, uh, these things whenever... He was interviewed by the New York Times after a flooding event that required the complete evacuation of over 100 animals over a two-day period. The facility was closed for six weeks and the zoo lost over $200,000 of income. And that is a disaster. 
Dictionary.com describes a contingency plan as a course of action to be followed if a preferred plan fails or an existing situation changes. Well, that's a pretty good definition, but if we're going to broaden this a little bit, we'll do it as we move through these modules, and you'll be given a little bit more guidance on how to develop those plans through proven process. We want to be sure that you understand the concept of whole community planning. Think about your location and how your business and your animals fit within that community. Good plans evolve with the input from your community, the first responders and others, and we'll talk more about that in subsequent modules. Let's explore why we need contingency plans for our captive wildlife and exotic animal industries. Mandates such as that Animal Welfare Act rule change should not be the only motivator that compels you to develop contingency plans. Animal welfare and the well-being of those animals are the highest priorities of those of us that work with and enjoy these animals, and there's a high societal value placed on them as well. When an elderly lion, a real ambassador for a zoo, was humanely euthanized due to complications of old age, the outpouring of support from the community continued for weeks. Flowers were left as exhibits. Certainly your community has bonds just like that with many of the animals in your care. The bonds that keepers and caretakers feel are even more powerful. These species cannot be neglected when it comes to planning. However, staff and human safety during incidents should be the top priority. Contingency plans and approved training may decrease the likelihood of your staff, volunteers, or animal owners getting injured when responding to an incident with these beloved animals. Robust plans and practices may also protect the public and responders when there are animal escapes or exhibit breaches. <clears throat> Development of plans with your first responders may protect them from danger too. If they're involved in response, you wouldn't want first responders rushing into a reptile house holding venomous species with potentially compromised enclosures, would you? Doing some pre-planning with them may prevent responders from being hurt, too. Think about disease issues. Many facilities work really hard at preventing indigenous wildlife from mixing with their exhibit animals to prevent disease transmission. Likewise, we don't want our animals escaping or transmitting disease to agricultural species or, worst case scenario, to people if the disease were zoonotic. Many in the exotic animal industry are heavily committed to conservation efforts for their species. If these animals are lost due to disease or disaster, that may represent a significant hit to the total species gene pool. We know there are sustainability issues with many species, so losing them due to lack of planning, is just not acceptable. It's just good business practice to have a contingency plan in place. Many of the intended audience for this training manage exhibits that are supported through ticket sales and other visitation models. The Katrina example showed that the facilities that had plans in place were able to recover quicker. They went right back to business continuity much faster than those that didn't. Planning may be the difference between recovery and permanent closure. Finally, never underestimate the power of public perception. The public is often your audience. Their support may fund your mission, and they have much to do with forming your reputation within your community. This quote was snagged from an online comment area in the response to a story which was published online and in print following a flooding event that occurred in a zoological facility quite a few years ago. Internet trolls come out of the woodwork after these tragic events, but I'm willing to bet that for every one of the nasty comments that appear after stories like this, that there are quite a few other members of the public that feel the same way. So, take a moment. Think about this comment. This is a quote from critics after another zoo was struck with disaster. If you're going to strip an animal of its home in the wild and stick it in a cage so we can all gawk at it for entertainment, then you better damn well put as much effort into keeping it safe as you do as keeping the public safe from it.
It isn't fair to say, well, Mother Nature did something unusual. Responsibility is responsibility. If you can't plan for unexpected emergencies, then you shouldn't have a zoo, period. While we can't really know what sort of planning this facility had actually done, this quote highlights the fact that the public expects that you're going to know what to do with your animals when these incidents do occur. As we continue with the presentation of these modules, where applicable, we're going to rely on using terminology that is used in the Incident Command System, or ICS. ICS is a flexible, scalable method for organizing incidents from pre-planned events to natural disasters. This system was actually invented by the fire service and they have time and again demonstrated the utility of this system. So we highly recommend that you learn a little more about ICS and consider drafting your contingency plans using this system as well. The ICS defines the roles and responsibilities of responders and it's designed to greatly expand or contract depending on the size of the incident. While we suggest that you take the basic incident command course, and there are links in the workbook, here are some basics that you might want to know anyway. The incident commander, I see, is in charge of the incident. That person must have the authority to manage the situation, and the IC may or may not need assistance of the command staff, depending on the size and the scope of the incident. The public information officer, or PIO as it's sometimes called, is the person who has the authority to update the public on an incident. Fire and police departments have designated PIOs who will address the media questions during their press conferences. A safety officer, or SO, is directly responsible for the safety of the responders. Response can be dangerous, and the incident commander looks to the safety officer to assure them that responders can do their job safely. A liaison officer has an important role too. As an example, say there's a fire in your community. Your facility may not be directly impacted by the fire, but the liaison officer with the responders will work with any stakeholder groups, including your facility, which may be impacted in some way by the fire, even if it didn't occur on your grounds. The general staff positions, operations, planning, logistics, finance, are all designed to perform the tasks needed for the response. They devise the best plan to reach the response objectives, and they acquire and pay for the resources needed to manage the incident. It's highly recommended that you learn a little more about ICS, and there are some links in the workbook, as I say, to various training courses. Since we just introduced ICS, we want to spend a bit of time emphasizing several of the basics of ICS and the management of emergencies or incidents. ICS has three basic objectives that are at the core of incident management, and these are ingrained in emergency managers and first responders all over the country. The first is preserve human life. The incident commander, who is the individual that has a responsibility for the management of the incident, recognizes that the safety of their responders and the public is the prime objective. As animal people, um, we think of them first. However, people can't do a good job of responding if they're not safe themselves. Make sure your plans and training emphasizes safety for your response personnel. The second objective of the ICS incident management system is stabilize the incident. This means what can be done to prevent further damage and what can be done to make this condition safer for the responders. And as we move forward through these modules and talk about incidents that can affect exotic animal industry, think about what strategies and tactics may be needed just to stabilize the incident. Think about a tornado moving through your facility. Where are some of the steps that might help stabilize that situation. Who assesses whether the animals are secure? Who will determine if live wires are down and dangerous to people or animals? Who is trained to turn off natural gas? These tasks may be done by your staff or by first responders, but determining responsibility and authority for doing these tasks should be included in your plans that allow for incident stabilization. The third overall objective of emergency management is to preserve property and the environment. Folks, that's your collection. If you haven't engaged 
in pre-planning, your animals may be low on the list. It is our duty as owners and caretakers of the animals to make sure that we're working with our locals so the needs of our animals are included in community planning. But we must reiterate that the safety of your staff, the public, and first responders still must come first. So, before we get started in some of the details of plan development, we want to suggest that you make a smart plan. Wherever possible, keep things simple. Simple things are easier to remember and easier to do during an emergency. Try to keep things measurable. Objectives such as our plan supports the evacuation of all guests from grounds within 30 minutes. Or we need to stockpile 40 bales of hay to last one week. Those are measurable. Especially when it comes to resources or stuff you need to respond to an incident, having measurable counts of things is really helpful. Plans should be achievable. If you write a fantastic plan, but there's never the reality that you can achieve it, it's not a very good plan. Start with what you know, start what you can do, build from there. When we say make it reasonable, that means it makes sense to your facility and to your local responders. Make it time sensitive by defining what you will do and recognize how long it will take to do it. Things always take longer than they think they should. Still, try to identify how long it may take to meet your objectives for managing an incident as well as the advanced preparations. So here's an example for you to consider. If one of your objectives of your contingency plan includes evacuation of an aviary, this is how you might conceptually organize it as a smart objective. You want to make sure that the birds are safe. You believe it's achievable objective and it's reasonable for you to do. If you ever become a student of ICS, you'll learn the incidents are managed by objective. It's a good idea to figure out what your goals and objectives are before you even write your plan. This allows you to start slow and it may seem overwhelming, but start your plan with some basic objectives. For example, all seven Dama Gazelles uh, should be preserved no matter what. Or... All outrage education animals the highest priority for preservation. When you start breaking things down into manageable chunks, you can then apply that simple principle to begin development of your plans. As a review, think about three overarching objectives of the ICS incident management and what are some of the elements in your plan that you'll need to achieve these objectives no matter what the hazard. For example, what are some elements or components required? Certainly, a good communication plan is critical for all three priorities. Preserving human life, stabilizing the incident, and preserving property and the environment. Every facility should have a human evacuation plan. Sometimes the best thing to do is to get people out of your facility for their own safety. The modules will go over some key points to consider when drafting plans to evacuate people. Short-term and longer-term sheltering in place of both people and animals should be part of your plans. What does your plan say about animal escapes? What sort of skills, plans, or tactics and training are needed for animal escapes? How will you shelter in place animals that cannot be moved? How will you prevent chemicals or fuel stored on the site from contaminating the environment in the event of an incident? The planning process, with the right partners in the room, will help you begin to develop plans to address these situations. So how do we start? It seems like a daunting task, but it doesn't have to be. The next module will introduce you to your partners in preparedness, and they may be your greatest asset.